Hi, everybody. OK, good. It's working. Um, so many people for a random person talking about the standard library. That's cool. OK, so let's, let's get into it. So um, let's start with myself. So my name is Ivana. I am currently a backend developer. I'm working in Austria. I'm working on a nice mobile app that probably doesn't tell anybody here anything. So <laughs> doesn't really make that much sense to talk about it much. Um, I have been dabbling in Python for more than five years. I like tea, I like games, I like weird music. And as long as I'm talking about games, if, if you're bored throughout my talk, you can, you can try to count how many game references there, there are in there. I mean, you don't get anything for it. I may have, I could have bought something, but you just get an insignificant nice point from me. Okay, so, but <clears throat> we are not here today to, to, to listen to me talk about myself. We are here today to listen to me talk about the Python standard library. So what you usually hear about the Python standard library is that, you know, unlike most things you can buy on Amazon, it comes with batteries included. So, but what is also true about the Python standard library and not about Amazon is that many of the things in there are actually useful. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm not, I'm not arguing maybe this is useful for somebody, but. Um, all right, so, so the Python standard library can do almost anything for you. There is, there is a lot of tools for many use cases, and everybody here probably has used it or is using it every single day. Um, there are some, let's say, hardware limitations to, to the Python standard library, so like there, is, there, there are some things that we can't do yet. Anyway, so um, I'll be talking about the Python standard library today, and most, more specifically, I'll be talking about uh, 373. Um, you, can, you can look it up on, on GitHub, and you probably already are familiar with the docs, so that's my two sources for, for this talk. Um, so, so when people say that the standard library is huge, it really is huge. It has more than 800 cont contributors and more than 10,000 commits. And this is just, just from basically two months ago, so maybe this has already grown. I'm mean, for sure this, this has already grown. Um, what you can also find in the standard library, more specifically in the, in the Python, Python part of the standard library, um, is 639 instances of XXX in the comments. So I looked at the comments because that's like the most important part about the code, right? So, like you can find things like, yeah, this is obviously wrong, see this issue. Or like, you know, somebody leaving a comment about maybe potentially some other comment that, that would be better to be, to be removed, which is kind of charming in itself. Um, or just like, you know, playing this guest <laughs> about your own existence and about the things you've done. And, and if you see where this is coming from, this last example, I think you, you, you can see where, where that disgust is coming from. Um, what you can also find there, again in the comments, is 80 mentions of hacks. So, like CPython developers are just people like us, right? So sometimes you just, you just do what you gotta do. <laughs> um, all right, and we also have some to-dos in there. So, you know, like the temporary solutions from the 90s. Um, so, yeah, just working around some issue because there is no other nicer way to do it right now. But maybe, you know, like 20 years, yeah, someday, someday, 20, 20 years from now, somebody's going to come up with something. Uh, there are 61 fix me's, um, many of which are located in the one <laughs> in the same file, which is the, the test for F strings. <laughs> Yeah, and um, you know, sometimes as a developer, like comments are basically your way of talking to, 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 to the other developers. And sometimes you really need to get your point across. And like, what is the best way to get your point across? Well, like using as many exclamation marks as possible, right? So 
<laughs> also, I would argue that some languages are better suited than others for like, you know, putting emphasis on your words. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. All right, so why am I starting off with this? Um, it's not just for fun. I mean, there's a little bit of fun in there, but um, the point is, C Python is pretty cool and it's pretty amazing, and we've all been using it, and we and we love it. But maybe if you're anything like me, you're not totally confident about the things you're doing, and maybe that holds you back from, for example, contributing to open source or for from contributing to C Python. But what this basically shows you is that. Like, you can maybe leave a to-do in there. Like, it's fine. It doesn't have to be 100% perfect. So go for it. OK. So let's take a step back from, from the most important part of the code to the actual libraries or, or modules, or, or more like the libraries in the standard library. So um, I have a very small selection here because I only have 30 minutes, but um, basically, I had two criteria for picking something, and one one criterion was, um, is this useful? And the other criterion was, is this somehow weird or funny, in some way? So I'm going to show off some some libraries, and if you can't tell which which one of these criteria, like, triggered it being there, then I didn't do, didn't do a very good job. But let's see. Okay, so let's start off with Turtle. So I didn't know before I researched for this talk that there is actually a Turtle graphics library in Python. So for those of you who don't know Turtle graphics, um, that's basically a way to teach kids programming. So you, so you get a graphics canvas, and you get a pointer, and you can program the pointer to move around, to draw things. And then you basically like do the, you do this by by commands, and then you can group the commands in functions and so on, and you learn some some abstractions and, and this sort of thing. So um, so Turtle is there basically for kids to to learn things, but we can also learn a great deal from looking at the source code of, of Turtle. So for example, you learn that sometimes it's okay to just use arbitrary constants. <laughs> um, yeah, um, you also you also learn how important it is to properly document your code. <laughs> and like, yeah, sometimes things just go wrong. <laughs> so error messages are also important. Yeah, um, I encourage you to try this out. If you haven't, this is there is a turtle basically ships with, with a tiny demo, um, and it's very um, cute. So, <laughs> so try it out. Um, all right. So another thing I want to talk about is string. Um, so string basically, I like string because it contains a lot of useful constants that you can use. So like imagine that you have to test something and you want to generate random strings, and like you would just need some sort of alphabet so that you can generate them from. And you can just import string and like it will give you all the ASCII letters or the ASCII lowercase letters or all the printables. And it's all there. And you don't have to go through like an extra step of coming up with, a, with an alphabet or something. Um, okay, next thing I wanna talk about is 223. And now I know nobody in this room uses Python 2 anymore, right? But like in the in the very remote case that that, that this would actually be the case, um, there is two to three, and like translating Python two to Python three is is a bummer, uh, but there's a lot of things that you can automate away. So and that's what two to three does for you. So it takes away all the tedious translation stuff that you have to do. So. So you basically give it, let's say this is your file, and you would, you would call 223 on it, and it will just give you a Python 3. Obviously, this doesn't magically take care of all your dependencies and like the actual brunt of work that you need to do when, when going from 2 to 3, but it helps with, uh, with the annoying stuff. 
Okay. Um, next thing I want to talk about is TextRap. I think TextRap is underappreciated because it's very nice. Um, so TextRap basically helps you with wrapping text. Um, so imagine you have like a long multi-line string like this, and and you and you and you basically like when, when you look at it, since it's a triple quoted string, you also get all the white space that that's in there. So basically, you get this with like all the indents in the in the beginning, and maybe or very likely this is not what you wanted in the first place. Um, but that's where text wrap comes comes in. So so this is our our string that we had. We can just import tdent from text wrap, and it takes. Uh, and it gets rid of the longest common white space that you have in the string. So it's very handy. Um, what you also want, to, maybe want to do is, is reflow your paragraph. So for example, make it smaller, make it bigger. So basically rearrange the new lines in some way. Um, TextRap can do this for you very easily. You just tell it how many characters should, should there be at most on one line and it takes care of, of the reflowing for you. Um, so, next up is web browser. So, that was also news to me, but then it kind of made, made sense, and you will see why in a bit, uh, that, there is, that there, is a, there is a module in the Python stand library whose sole purpose is to, to give you the means of opening a web page in your browser. And like this might sound simple, but if you look at it or if you think about it for a bit, it's really not because it supports multiple operating systems, it's, it supports multiple browsers, and it's actually quite a big mess. But it works very well. Um, like the question is what you would actually use this for. I mean, I don't know, but if you for some remote reason wanted to open this XKCD comic <laughs> in the browser, you could do it like this. And if you don't know what I'm getting at here, please try this out in your Python interpreter. So I don't know if this was the only reason for including web browser as a module in the standard library, but it might as well have been. Yeah. And as, as long as we're looking at anti-gravity, you know there's actually something else inside there. It also has to do with XKCD. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not spoiling anything. Look it up. So, so the next thing I want to talk about is URL lib. URL lib helps you with all your URL needs. So it, it can compose URLs for you, it can break them apart, it can, it can URL encode them, and so on and so on. Um, so imagine like a usual everyday scenario, you want to evolve your EV and you want to look up how to do it. So there are nice, nice APIs on the net, like for example the Pokey API, which which has like all the information about everything in Pokemon, and you can you can just query it. So let's 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 just use URL lib for it, right? Because it's right there. So it's very simple. So you just import URL open from URL lib request, and you URL open the the URL, right? I mean, yeah. It, except you should maybe send a header because. I mean, it's just you know good practice to actually tell the people maintaining the API why you're contacting their API and that they are not malicious. So, so yeah, let's send the header, right? Um, except you can't really do that with URL open, but it's not it's not really an issue because you can just import request class from the same from the same module, and and just and just send it basically as a dict with the with the request. Um, so, so you just do this, and basically you're done, right? Um, yeah, not really, because this gives you bytes. But again, this is not an issue. You can just import JSON, right? And then JSON load the whole thing, and and basically by the by the time you're done doing all of this, your EV has already evolved out of boredom and like into the most useful, useless, useless type ever. Sorry, Glacian. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, okay, I know I am here advocating for the standard library, but. Maybe this once, you know, <laughs> just to. This. So, uh, by the way, this is also what what um, official documentation for URL lib um, recommends. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
Um, OK, so we, we install requests. And then we can just request get the whole thing and send the headers along with it and then JSONify it. I mean, dictify it. Um, yeah, but that's not actually why I wanted to talk about this. I wanted to talk about this because of pretty print. And pretty print is very nice. So what you get back is like this really huge JSON. I mean, not really huge if you work with APIs like I do, but um, like kind of big JSON. And I like all is well and like good. Like if you want to visualize this somehow, it's kind of hard though. And you could copy paste it to, to an editor and somehow beautify it and then also take care of the apostrophes turning into quotes so it's actual JSON and like yada yada. Or you can you know, just import pretty print and, and let it do this all for you in, in just two lines. Yeah. Okay. So, so the next thing I want to talk about is either tools. And you probably know either tools, especially if you're coming from functional languages. Um, so it helps you with iterating over stuff. And it's very handy. So imagine you have you have a um, nested list like this, and you somehow want to flatten it. So there is no flattening in Python, right? As you've probably all found out at some point. Uh, but it's really not that hard to do because there is in inter in iter tools there is a there is a function that does this for you. So it constructs an iterator that iterates over an iterable of iterables, and it basically goes element by element in the inner iterables. So essentially, it flattens the list if you make a list out of it. Um, it has this a bit weird constructor, but it also has, an, has another constructor, so you can use whichever one you, one you want. Um, Okay, there is another thing that I want to highlight from either tools, and that is um, take while and drop while. That is also a very functional thing. Um, so basically, if you have if you have a sequence, and you want to either only take a prefix of it or drop a prefix of it and take the rest based on some condition, you can do this with with drop while and take while. So for example, here um, we drop the prefix of the sequence that is smaller than 30. So all the elements that are smaller than 30. But once, once, we, once we hit the first one that is greater, uh, we stop. So it's really just about the prefix. Yeah. OK. Um, and following along the same lines, so functional stuff, um, func tools. So this, is, this has to do with higher order functions, so functions which take other functions and do, do something with them. Um, there is, if, if, if you're coming from Haskell, for example, you probably, probably miss your folds, or I, <laughs> I mean, I did at some point, uh, but then I realized that there is actually a fold in, in Python, it's called reduce, um, and it's in func tools. And what it basically does is that it progressively applies a function on a sequence and, and folds it in that, in that regard. So for example, here you take the GCD, so the greatest common divisor, and you first apply it on the 105 and 21, then you take the result of that and use that as the left operand for the next element. And you continue like this until you reach the end of the list. So this is handy because if you have something that you can use in this way, you can, for example, find out the GCD of, of a whole range of numbers, not just, not just two that is defined on. Originally, originally, okay, okay. Um, so there is this thing um, that you probably or that you might have experienced in your work life. Uh, you have a function which is very expensive. So I don't know. It does a call to a very slow server, or like it takes a very long time to compute, or there is some other issue with it. Um, but the nice thing about the function is that it's stable. So given the same arguments, it always gives you the same result. So at some point, you probably will come up with some sort of cache for it, right? So you can just have a dict, maybe, that, that like takes the arguments um, as keys and then saves the result so that you don't have to compute it again and again when, when you already have the result for that, for those arguments. So yeah, like it, that's about all well and good, but then you have to sort of do some, some housekeeping around the dict, like make sure it doesn't grow too large, and then you have to decide what, you, what you're actually going to 
going to remove from it once it does, and like it's not it's not hard or anything, but it's kind of annoying. So you could do all this, or you could just import LRU cache from functools and wrap your function in it. And basically, all of this that I just said is happening in the background. So you don't have to do anything. It's an LRU cache, so the least recently used elements, um, or the, the yeah, the least recently used elements are going to be the first ones to go away. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so so far, I mostly talked about like functions that you can find in a standard library and that you can use. Um, there is there is a very nice very nice um, library in the standard library uh, that gives you additional data structures. So it's called collections. And so imagine, for example, that you have a list like this, and you have you have some things that are maybe multiple times, and you want to you want to have a count of each element, like how many times it is in the list for some reason. Um, so you can iterate over it and like make it dict and, and count it, but you can also just just make a counter out of it, which does all of this for you. And a counter is basically just a glorified dict. It's it's a dict because you can just access the elements with their names as keys. Um, and the elements being the, the actual count of the of the thing. And it's glorified because if you try to access something that is not there, then it just gives you zero because the count is zero. So no key errors for you. Yeah. Um, okay, let's let's go back to the normal dict. So imagine you have a dict like this now. Like you have people and you have their occupations. And obviously what happens if you try to access somebody who is not there, well, Python is unhappy with you and for a good reason. So um, there's, there, there are many use cases though where you, where you don't want this to happen. And that's where default dict comes in. So again, from collections, a default dict is basically a dictionary that does something on, on missing elements. So instead of throwing the error, it would, it would um, execute the lambda here. And it would save save the result basically. So again, so we so we create basically um, an empty default dict here. We insert the first two people, and now if we try to if we try to access Brandon, we get the not available back because that's the that's the lambda that, that we provided in the first place. Yeah, and that's a good thing because if you try to actually like put all of Brandon's occupations in there, that would be a bit too much maybe. Okay, so so now imagine this scenario. Okay, you okay, not not you, but like the other person. Okay, not not you wrote this like very convoluted code, and it's like there is like a call um, call progression going over multiple modules, and then you can, for the life of you, realize what's going on and and like where this thing is called from, and and it's all very frustrating. So uh, there is traceback for you, which basically just prints the exception trace, or the, the, the stack trace, not the exception trace in this case. Um, so in this case, like if you have three functions like this, you, and you print stack in the third one, you see that Pacificate was called from full verify and full verify was called from form linking. And okay, now I realize that probably some people in the audience are like looking at me like, what is she talking about? Like, I have a debugger, right? So I just put the breakpoint there. And does she also use prints to debug? Yes, I do. But, but okay, I'm gonna settle this debate once and for all, okay? So, have your fancy IDs, but can your fancy IDs help you clean your bathroom? <laughs> like, I didn't think so, so. Just kidding, IDs are great. Um, yeah, so that was, that was it. Um, so there's a ton of good stuff in there. That is a, there's a ton of funny stuff in there too. Um, there is not enough time, obviously, to talk about everything. Like, not, not nearly enough. Uh, so this was, this was a very small selection. So I just want to re reiterate basically what I said at the start, that the Python standard library can do almost anything, like with the hardware limitations that we talked about. Although, has actually anybody tried this? Like, I'm gonna embarrass myself here now, but let's try. Okay. Oh, 
Oh, he does something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> OK, my point here being <laughs> that for the things you cannot find in the standard library, you can just go and buy PI. <laughs> There's a lot of weird stuff on there. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thank you very much, Ivana, for a wonderful uh, presentation. <laughs> um, we have five minutes for uh, four minutes for questions. So please, uh, yeah. Uh, oh, okay, I'll come. Um, so this is not a question, but I recently found out that clearly you can import this in an interpreter. Import this. Import. This. Oh yeah, that is a very yeah. nice one too. Yeah. So as long as I have the. I have the big screen, actually, here. Yeah, it's a bit it's like this. Questions? Yeah? What about the other integrity one? The other integrity one. Yeah. You don't want to do your research. <laughs> uh, I actually don't have don't have internet here, but yeah, I can just okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I can do it now. Sorry, <laughs> I'm too nervous. But you have to look it up. Okay. Okay. Uh, but it's uh, it's just there. And I don't want to spoil it. That's the right reason. Any question? I have one. There was, okay. a, uh, there was an, an image that appeared briefly on one of the slides. Uh -huh. <laughs> an image. An image? Which <laughs> Did one? I didn't get that. What was it? What was it? Yeah. It was one. <laughs> I think everyone was always wondering that. Uh, Probably mean the slug, right? Before the reference from this one? Yeah, that, that one. Yeah, well, this is this is like the quote is from FTL this game, and that's a, that's a slug, that's a race, that's in the game. Okay. Like you're you're piloting your spaceship and like micromanaging everything. Any more questions? No? Then uh, thank you. Thank you.